cooking. I think all of us are here together because in some home. way Erica Jung was seminal for you. Yeah. yeah. I remember yeah. seminal. Yeah. When I was uh, a young girl, uh, prepubescent in nature, I <laughs> went to my mother's bedroom drawer, <laughs> and I remember that drawer as if it were yesterday, had a brass knob, and I pulled it open and I took out her copy of Fear of Flying, and stole it away to my bedroom with a flashlight, and read it, and return it, and of course my mom probably knew all about this, but it was something that I felt so sneaky. And so it made a vibe by her work. I mean, it was really something that just sparked, and I think actually led me to something of the woman that I've been in relationships and in life in general, because the book just awoke my imagination. And now she brings us a fear of dying, which is totally, again, speaking to my life with you know, somewhat what we would call adult children and aging parents and adult relationships and the body changing and husband relationships and all done sexy and funny and wise and full of life. You are just carrying me along. You just really are. And I think that you have done that for so many of us in the room. Yeah. So, relevant at all times, I give you Erica John. Okay, if that's okay, but I do walk around a bit, so don't worry. Um, is the mic on? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Can everybody hear? Yeah. Yes. Yes. If you can hear, shoot your hand up. Was that a hand? <laughs> or a gland. What was it? Okay. So, I love this part of the world. And if my grandchildren didn't live in New York City and Scottsdale, Arizona, I would live here. And if my husband weren't admitted in New York and California, there's Susie Bletterman. <laughs> Childhood friend. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful researcher, wonderful uh, medical person who did research. Susie, welcome. I'm so happy to see your face. Um, where was I? I can't remember. I love this part of the world. But my grandchildren um, met and Darwin and Maxie live in New York. Yeah. So it's going to be a while before I live here. And my other grandchild, Francesca, whom I named after Dante Alighieri's main squeeze, she's called Franny. And someday she'll read the Divina Commedia and she'll know that her step-grandma loved her <laughs> and wanted her to be Francesca. Someday she'll know that. But she is a child of mixed race. I probably use the politically incorrect term. She is a WOC, a woman of color. And I'm supposed to be white, but I feel like a WOC. But the ladies who are true WOCs don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Um, so here we are. I, I have to thank you, my readers, because we all need readers. I write absolutely every book thinking no one will ever read it. And with fear of dying, because that's the only way I can do it, really. With fear of dying, it took me nine years to write the book. Why did it take me nine years to write the book? Well, my parents were old and frail, and they looked like they were getting ready to go. And I couldn't abandon them. And my daughter had three babies. And in our family, we had enormous babies. Somewhere genetically, I don't know, somewhere back in Russia and Poland, and <laughs> wherever, the land of pogroms, where my family comes from, 
God only knows, right? And uh, my daughter, I had to be near her while she was pregnant. I just did. I don't know why, but I had to be. And, and then my husband nearly died of an aneurysm of the aorta. But my husband has mazel, 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 <laughs> which is good luck. And bless him, because he went into the hospital. I got him to the right hospital. I get hysterical when someone I love is ill. And I have this ability to scream at am ambulance drivers <laughs> and say, you are not going to Lenox Hill. You are going to New York Hospital. And, and they say to me, but we are required to go to that hospital because it's in the Cashman area. And I say, Cashman, Schmashman, you're going to the other hospital. I don't usually behave that way. In life. But I do when somebody I love is threatened. And I have that thing, what do we call it? Survival instinct? I don't know what you call it. So they take him to a hospital where the man who discovers that he has an aneurysm of the aorta takes him upstairs to the catheterization lab. And they didn't know what it was. They thought it was a mild heart attack downstairs. And then they realized we had health insurance. <laughs> and they took him upstairs to the calf lab, and there they said, sit down before we tell you this. And I said, why, we need a second opinion. They said, no, no, you don't need a second opinion. He will die within about five minutes if we don't operate. And my BFF, fortunately, was next to me, translating my best friend forever, who now lives in Portland, where I'm going tomorrow. She's abandoned in New York. But she's not, she is not uh, married to a man who's admitted in New York and Connecticut, and her grandchildren don't live around the corner, so it's good. So she says to me, Erica, what he's saying is you can't get a second opinion, or Ken will die. And it's a good thing she was there, because I was deaf, dumb, and blind at that point. And my best friend in the world is called Jerry Koretsky. And she is one of the people to whom this book is dedicated. And it's dedicated to Jerry, my BFF, and l'ultimo marito, Ken, my last husband, Ken, in Italian, which I studied at Barnard and in Italy. And because I love Italian culture and I love the language and I and I think the Italians are one of the lost tribes of Israel. What can I do? <laughs> <laughs> they love, they love, they love family, they love food, they love conversation, they love love. They love, 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 love. And I would never marry an Italian man if he were the last man I had <laughs> In Italy, I would never marry an Italian man because they're players and they only love mama. And, but I'm not speaking of American Italians. I'm speaking of Italian Italians. And many of them were very major in my life, but I didn't marry a single one of them. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so, how did this book start? This book is called Fear of Dying. And when I wrote it, it was called Happily Married Woman. <laughs> and, and then about nine years along writing of the book, it became Happily Married Woman or Fear of Dying. And the first chapter is Happily Married Woman or Is There Sex After Death? <laughs> and, the, um, and the epigraph is, I generally avoid temptation unless I can't resist it. <laughs> May West, stealing from Oscar Wilde. <laughs> so the difference between a great writer and a mediocre writer is that the great writers only steal from the best. <laughs> we all steal, right? Sometimes we steal without knowing it. 
and sometimes we steal knowing it, but we only steal from the top. I grew up stealing from Oscar Wilde, the divine Oscar Wilde. Um, I should tell you a little bit. I grew up in a family of bohemians. Uh, I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan when the, you could live in a triplex designed by Stanford White and the rent was $200 a month. Now the apartment I grew up in is $20 million or $25 million and the only people who could afford it are hedge fundies or investors or and they or Russian oligarchs. <laughs> there are a lot of those in New York. Or and mostly they prefer London because if they stay too long in New York, the taxes are too high, and they'd rather spend the money buying art. So we have a lot of Russian oligarchs in New York, and we have a lot of people in the financial business. And all the places that, where the, the artists used to live, Greenwich Village, the Upper West Side, the street I grew up on was filled with actors and artists and whatever, and school teachers even, you know. But now that street, every apartment is 15 to 20 to 30 to 40 million dollars. <laughs> It was opposite the Museum of Natural History. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in that museum. And the one thing that nobody knows about me, and no interviewer ever asks me, is that I am besotted with science. I used to see Margaret Mead walking down Central Park West with her staff, another barter woman. And I would go up to her and I would say, you are my heroine. And she would look at me as if, who is this Fisher? <laughs> uh, but I had enough manners not to stop her and take a selfie. We didn't have selfies. <laughs> we now have a pandemic of selfies. And people don't want to read, they just want to take a picture of standing next to you because they want to prove they met you. Why? I cannot figure out. <laughs> what a, okay. So there I am on West 77th Street. My parents were hippies of the 1930s. My father's famous, famous incident was my parents used to go to P-Town, Provincetown, every summer. And my father was famous for getting stark naked, carrying a bell and streaking down Commercial Street in Provincetown, <laughs> saying, Hear ye, hear ye, Fabis and Agoya. Which means, listen to me, all you uptight Goyam Christians, or Wasps, or whatever. You can translate it in many ways, but they were the uncool people, okay? And my parents were cool. My mother was an artist. My father was a musician. My father auditioned for Cole Porter in 1935 and made his Broadway debut in Jubilee, 1935. My father left music probably around the time I was born. And he became an importer from Japan after World War II and he made a lot of money. But he always had a Steinway, Steinway piano, and he always had seats at the Philharmonic in a box, and he always had opera tickets at the Met in a box, and we were dragged to concerts, art museums, and I would go into the bathroom and put on powder pink lipstick by um, powder pink lipstick by Revlon. <laughs> because I was bored by Leonard Bernstein by jumping around on the podium like this. And now I realize that what my father gave me in teaching me music was priceless, utterly priceless. But you know how your parents become saints when they're dead? Mm -hmm. <laughs> this happens. Um, even Molly says to me sometimes, my daughter, she says, I suppose I'll love you when you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and right now you're quite annoying. <laughs> so, and my mother 
dragged me through all the art museums in, in Europe from the time I was 13 and said, see that picture? That's Vigée Lebrun. Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun was very close friends with Marie Antoinette. And when the Bastille fell, she had to leave Paris and run to Italy because taking her nine-year-old daughter by the hand. And nobody knows about her because she's a woman artist. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up as a feminist, OK? People say, did you discover feminism during the second wave? I had a grandmother, my mother's mother, who only went to women dentists and women doctors uh, because she was a member of the first wave, and she understood that women had been starved and beaten in order to get us the vote. <coughs> Force-fed in jail. Uh, we got the vote in 1920 in the United States, and then all the women thought, well, we did it. Uh, we can stop now. But what they didn't realize was that feminism is like democracy. When you stop fighting for it, it disappears. <laughs> You have to keep fighting, and in every generation, you win it again. And when you stop, it's like democracy. When you stop, the fascists appear. It doesn't matter where. It can be any country in the world. But when you stop, the fascists rush in. And it doesn't matter whether that country is Turkey, Afghanistan, uh, Russia, Poland, it doesn't matter. It could be France uh, with the Vichy regime. It could be anywhere. It could be Hitler's Germany. It doesn't matter. Everywhere in the world. When you stop fighting for democracy, the fascists rush in. And they have all kinds of gimmicks that they use. The biggest one is the Mayo God. Uh, but it doesn't matter what gimmick they use, right? You know, they overthrew Ishtar and Aphrodite and all the female goddesses of the ancient world. It doesn't matter. Whatever it is, it's a gimmick to get women back in the kitchen, to get them having 10 babies, and to keep them out of political power. And that's really what it's about. And another part of it is, Take the people who have the most money and take their money and send them to the guillotine, um, the stake, burn them. It doesn't matter who they are. They could be Jews, they could be, at, they could be, um, could be a holocaust of the Ottoman Empire. They will kill the richest, most successful people. They will burn the most successful women. And it's just because they want what they have. And it's not about God, and it's not about Buddha, and it's not about Jesus, and it's not about Hashem. It's just, we don't like you, we want what you have. It doesn't matter. And these movements are sometimes led by men. But there have been a few led by women. I am ashamed to say, but it is true. And it's really about, we want what you have, give it to us. End of story. And sometimes they say, Allah wishes it. And sometimes they say, Hashem wishes it. And sometimes they say, Jesus would never marry two men. This is still going on, by the way. Jesus would never marry two women. Is Jesus talking to that woman? Where is she? whatever, um, and speaking in her ear and saying you're not allowed to marry two women or two men? Well, she thinks so. We might also say that only schizophrenics believe God is speaking in their ear. Um, whatever. But it happens. The human race is not perfect, sadly. You know, we wish we were, but we're not. So. I grew up in a family of artists who were madly lit, uh, liberal, or they thought they were. And um, I grew up around Yiddish actors and Broadway musicians and 
I grew up around writers and artists and whatever, and uh, this seemed completely normal to me. It didn't seem to me there were any other kinds of people in the world, because those are the people I grew up with. And they were wonderful, and they were warm, and they were loving, and they were impossible. <laughs> I mean, im fucking possible. <laughs> they would tell you what to do all the time. <laughs> and they were very, they didn't keep their opinions to themselves. <laughs> Not at all. And they believed, my parents, that girls should get an education. And that they better get, my father believed, you better get a BA at a good college, an MA at a good college, and if you can be a doctor, even better. Because the only way you will ever succeed in this world as a woman is if you have something that removes you from the majority of the oppressed women. So my father wanted me to be a doctor. And Susie's father wanted her to be a doctor, right? <laughs> and it was love that did it. It wasn't done out of meanness. It was done out of love. They wanted you to rise above the women down there. End of story. It was love. And every successful woman I have ever met was adored by her father and her grandfather and her great-grandfather, and so was I. And that's it. And we love men because men supported us. We, we love men. Men were, you know, the ones, and when we grew up and we were too pretty, the women wanted to knock us down. And you might ask why my mentors as a young writer were Henry R Miller and John Updike. Why were they not Elizabeth Hardwick and whatever? Well, they weren't because the women in the literary world took one look at me in my mini skirt and my white go-go boots <laughs> and they looked at me as if drop dead right now, you have blonde hair down to your pubic. <laughs> and that was it. So my great mentors were Henry Miller and John Updike, who were mocked by the other men who accused them of only wanting to fuck me, which neither of them ever did. <laughs> and then there were bunches of young women who took one look at me and said, we don't like her. She has long blonde hair and she wears mini skirts. And there was a lot of that going on in my generation too. And it's still going on. But it's going on in the guise of other academic buzzwords. In my time, the academic buzzword was, I can't even remember what it was, but it was something. Who knows what it was? Those women said that I could not possibly be a feminist because I liked men and I wore makeup. And in my generation, that wasn't fashionable. You were supposed to wear army boots and overalls and get enormously fat. And if you wore lipstick, you were counter-revolutionary. Okay. I was once booed off the stage at the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco for reading poems about breastfeeding. Um, we were not supposed to do that because it was, was counter-revolutionary. Uh, now the terminology is different. It's intersectionality, whatever the hell that is, which means that if you don't have a disability, you're not a WOC, and you're not, what else? You don't belong to 10 oppressed groups. You're not in a wheelchair, you're not in, <laughs> we're supposed to, every oppressed group is supposed to fight every other oppressed group. <laughs> Duh, I thought we were uniting. <laughs> what is that about? I don't think it will help any of us, and it certainly will not help women if we start fighting over what color are you? I mean, and if we start fighting over what religion are you? I, we were supposed to leave that stuff behind us and unite. What was that about? I don't believe in any of those gods. 
I believe in Aphrodite. I believe in the force that through the green fuse feeds the flower, Dylan Thomas. I believe in the wind going through the aspen trees. I believe that nature is animated and that the priests figured out a way to get the people to do what they wanted. And there you have it, basically. So I was raised by a mother who said, we don't die, we become tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and every seed of the tomato will be planted and bear another tomato plant. Mm. And I said, oh my God, I can't <laughs> believe this bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> my mother was a pagan without knowing it. She was Wiccan without knowing it. She had a green thumb. She could make anything grow. So, it's 1.20. How much time do we have, Ken? Well, maybe another five or so minutes and then okay. questions? Because I think you have questions, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the book starts here. I used to love the power I had over men. Walking down the street, my mandolin-shaped ass swaying and swinging <laughs> to their backward eyes. How strange that I only completely knew this power when it was gone or transferred to my daughter, all male eyes on her nubile 20-ish body promising babies. I missed this power. It seemed that the things that had come to replace it, marriage, maternity, the wisdom of the mature woman, should fade away. I hate that phrase, the mature woman. Ugh. <laughs> The wisdom was not worth the candle. Ah, the candle. <laughs> Standing up, burning for me, full of sound and fury, signifying everything. I know I should fade away like a good old girl and spare my daughter the embarrassments of my passions. But I can't any more than I can conveniently die. Life is passion. But now that I know what passion costs, it's hard to be carefree anymore. Was I ever carefree? Was anyone? Wasn't love always an exploding cigar? <laughs> Didn't Gypsy Rosalie say, God is love, but get it in writing? <laughs> Fanny Bryce say, love is like a card trick. Once you know how it works, it's no fun anymore. <laughs> Those old broads knew a thing or two. And did they ever give up? Never! I'm not going to tell you yet how old I am or how many times I've been married. I have decided never to get any older than 50. <laughs> My husband and I read the obituaries together more often than we have sex. <laughs> I'm only going to say that when all the troubles of my family engulfed me and I realized that my marriage could not save me, I reached a point where I was just unhinged enough to put the following ad on zipless.com, a sex site on the internet. <laughs> happily married woman with extra erotic energy seeks happily married man to share same. Come celebrate Eros one afternoon per week. Discretion guaranteed by playful, pretty, imaginative, witty woman. Send email and recent picture. Talk about a woman on the verge of a nervous breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> it was autumn in New York. Season of mellow mists. That's Keats. Jewish holidays and 5,000 plate dinners for rare and chic diseases. <laughs> a time of new beginnings, Yom Kippur. Starting over, Rosh Hashanah. Laying acorns for a bare winter, Sukkot. When I placed the ad, I had thought of myself as a sophisticated, coolly interviewing lovers. And then I was overcome with panic. I began fantasizing about what sort of creeps, losers, retreads, extortionists, <laughs> and homicidal maniacs such an ad would attract. And then I got so busy with my ailing parents and my pregnant daughter that I forgot all about it. A few minutes went by, then suddenly the responses poured out of the internet like coins out of a slot machine. I was afraid to look. 
After a couple of beats, I couldn't resist. It was like hoping I'd won the lottery. The first response showed a scanned Polaroid of an erect penis, <laughs> a tawny, uncircumcised specimen with a drop of dew winking <laughs> at the tip. Excuse me. Under the photo, on the white border, was scrawled without Viagra. <laughs> the accompanying email was pre was precise or concise, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I like your style, have always risen for assertive women. <laughs> <laughs> Please send nude shot and measurements. <laughs> <laughs> the next one went like this. Dear seeker, Sometimes we think it's carnality we want when actually we long for Jesus. <laughs> we discover that if we open our hearts and let him in, all sort of satisfaction undreamt of can be ours. Perhaps you think you are seeking Eros, but it is Thanatos you really seek. <laughs> in Jesus there is eternal life. He is the lover who never disappoints, the friend who is loyal forever, it would be an honor to meet and counsel you. A telephone number was proffered. 1-800-JESUS. <laughs> and when she meets one of these men, I'll give you this. He wants her to wear a rubber suit with a zipper here and a zipper here and a zipper over her vagina, as Oprah calls it. I call it a vagina. Um, I believe, I believe that, as Caitlin Moran says, if you have a vagina, you are a feminist. You may not know it. Caitlin Moran is a wonderful Irish writer who writes a column in London probably one of the most sexist cities in the world. And she says, why do you say you're not a feminist? Do you have a vagina? <coughs> you're a feminist. And you might not know it, but eventually you will. And Gloria says, we are the gender that gets more radical with age. So I don't worry about those millennial daughters having babies and reading Dr. Sears, who say you have to wear your baby in a sling and you have to co-sleep, and because they're just not old enough. So don't fault them. At some point, they will know that co-sleeping with your infant could possibly destroy your marriage. Maybe it won't. Maybe you're lucky. And that breastfeeding morning, night, and noon. We have these big babies. My, <coughs> my daughter weaned herself at five months. The nanny started giving her applesauce. And she was big. I mean, in my family, we have 10-pound babies. Maybe it's a sign of diabetes. <laughs> We're all pre-diabetic anyway. But all I can tell you is Molly was five, six months when suddenly I had to give her pablum and applesauce and whatever, and the nanny completely delighted in giving her other food because she would say, Mrs. Fast, I've never worked in a community like this. I only work in Greenwich. <laughs> and I, which is a very, a community where all the houses cost $20 million. And I lived in an artist's community further up, further north of New York City. And she didn't like that. And she didn't want me to nurse the baby. And she would sort of grab the baby and say, Mrs. Fast, I don't, work with nursing moms. <laughs> and I fired her after two weeks, right? Yeah. But that stuff was still going on in 1978 when my daughter was born. So I don't believe what you read in the papers. Anyway, I want you to ask whatever questions you want and need to ask. So, who's gonna be first? <laughs> yes. Well, you're from New York City, so I wanna know what we need to do about Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing a newspaper or, or
or cable channel. What I would do about Donald Trump, I would ignore him. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would Roger Ailes, who I've met and who flirted with me unbelievably. I would say, don't cover him. Let him sink. But Donald, you know, Ro Roger Ailes is a very right-wing guy. And he covers him and covers him and covers him. And Donald Trump is the best thing for cable TV that ever happened, right? Ratings, ratings, ratings. And basically what's happening is the Republican Party, I call them the Republicans, <laughs> don't know that they're committing suicide. Because we hope. But by Donald Trump is exposing what they all agree with. They hate immigrants. They don't like anyone who speaks Spanish or any other language that is not American. Um, it, I don't call it the English language, I call it the American language. Okay? And they are doing very, very well. The t cable networks think that they're making out like bandits, but what they're exposing is the, what is at the heart of the Republican Party. Hatred of women, hatred of immigrants, hatred of anybody who speaks Spanish. We live in a bilingual country now, right? And it, by hating immigrants, you're not going to get rid of that. And actually, we could be celebrating the Spanish language, which has some of the best poets who ever wrote. Garcia Lorca, um, Pablo Neruda. Um, we could be celebrating the riches of that language instead of saying, speak up a <laughs> You know, I, I don't know, sue me, but that's what I think. Yes. <laughs> yes, the lady in, uh, in the blonde hair. Um, just if you're, um, what? You have a vagina, you're a woman. What yeah, do you think? Uh, 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 okay, <laughs> you're a feminist. I'm following. Uh, yeah, louder, because yeah. I can't hear. Yeah. Um, what do you think of transgender men? Think oh, that's so complicated. <laughs> Everything I say will be misinterpreted. <laughs> <laughs> it's really complicated. I think that if you're six foot four and you're an Olympic athlete <laughs> and you become a woman, you don't know what it's like to be a little girl who's a girl. But I know that there are people feeling they were born into the wrong body and who have been very unhappy about it all their lives. And I would never deny those people the right to be happy. Why would I? Problem. And, and that's really what I think, but do, would Bruce Jenner really know what it's like to be my bet bet, a seven-year-old girl who goes to a girl's school, Chapin School, and who I hope will go to Barnard College, my mm -hmm. alma mater. Um, he can't know what it's like to be bet bet and to be in danger of rape. And when Bet Bet starts to have those beautiful little bud like breasts, we'll worry about her wherever she goes. And when she, my daughter and I will worry. And when Francesca, who's just on the verge of puberty, my other granddaughter, will worry. You know, will she be raped? Will she be subject to sexual violence? Will some guy with an Uzi <coughs> rape her and cut her throat? or a Kalashnikov or whatever. And we live in, live in a country of gun violence. Mm -hmm. And children are killed and women are killed. And it's a madness. And, they, and the insane people can buy guns on the internet. It is a madness. What kind of country allows the insane to buy guns on the internet? Right. Yeah. So I worry about my granddaughters um, very much. But I believe I've had friends who were transgender. I've had relatives who were transgender. And there are people who were born thinking they were given the wrong gender. And my heart goes out to them. And that's all I can say about it.
Yeah. Yes. I read Fear of Flying in high school, mm -hmm. and I totally related to the book, so much so I read it five times. <laughs> <laughs> and I wrote a 20-page paper about it in college. Right. Um, so the whole idea of being liberated, sexually liberated, and the zipless fuck, that totally resonated with me, and I lived my life that way for some time. Mm -hmm. But now I'm 60, and like you, that's not really what I'm looking for. Right. And I wonder, do you think it is hormonal that at some age, perhaps you know, because of menopause or whatever, we turn from that being the focus to being with a partner who gives us something different? Connection. Mm -hmm. And and if in fact it is hormonal or, or whatever it is, do you think it's a good thing? How, how do you feel about it? I think that's a fascinating question, and I really have thought about it a lot throughout my life. I think it's partly hormonal. I think it's partly the way our grandmothers and mothers train us. Partly. Not all, but partly. And I think it's partly, look, I, my first marriage, I married my first lover. And class of Barnard 63, we often married our first lover, right? Um, some did, some didn't. There were some, like my older sister, Susanna, who were wild, at, starting at 13, 14, 15. But in the end, she married a Lebanese Christian from Beirut and raised six children in Beirut. And her, and only left when it became too dangerous to live there. And my late brother-in-law had the dream that the Lebanese and the Israelis would unite and create the largest tourist industry ever known. <laughs> <laughs> he was such an optimist. <laughs> and, and he wrote poetry, and he was really in many ways a lovely man. And she met him at Columbia. And, um, and it's all gone the other way for now. I do believe that there will come a time if we don't completely destroy this beautiful planet, which we're on the way to doing, uh, I believe there will come a time when the Lebanese and the Israelis and the Arab world will unite for something good. It may be 100 years, it may be 200 years, because violence and fear don't lead anywhere good. And sooner or later, the fascists, the dictators, um, people rise up against them and say, we don't want to live in a place where we're afraid of being killed everywhere, where uh, we're afraid our daughters will be raped. But sometimes it takes a while. And by a while, I mean it could take 100 years, it could take 200 years. I've read Mona El Tawi's recent book, The Middle East Needs a Sexual Revolution. And it's true, you know? But she doesn't mention Israel in the book. Uh, she's an Egyptian, she's an Egyptian intellectual, and she's a lovely woman who I've been at the Aspen Writers Conference with. But I, because she didn't mention Israel, I wanted to write to her publisher and say, Israel has had a sexual revolution. Why are the rest of the Middle East wanting to kill Israel? Maybe that's why, who knows? Um, but it may take a long time for this to happen because there are fanatics in power. There are fanatics in power everywhere in the world. North Korea, there are fanatics in power. The Middle East, there are fanatics in power. In Israel, we have Netanyahu, who is in a way a fanatic. In um, the United States, we have these neocons who want to get a Bush back in power. And the Bush family has been sucking the public tit for three generations. The grandfather of Jeb Bush was friends with Hitler. So, you know, what you're going to do, you know, once you have an education and you see these connections, yes? I think that I'm from Middle East, and I think that uh, people uh, over there, uh, not everybody, but majority, especially the leaders and the way they uh, lead the countries and nations, they are actually 
in the medieval time, which we were four or five uh, centuries ago in Western uh, part of the world. So they are going through the same kind of uh, things women if they want to get ahead. That's the they medieval want to period of the West. And, yeah. to, and I was kind of one of Can you be louder because people in the back want to hear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, what? Oh, it's long. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sorry, and then I want to just tell you that I was one of the victims of the Iran Revolution, and mm -hmm. uh, they, yeah, took away, they, they took away. Your my name is Shokufe Chushu. Uh huh. <laughs> this questioner says she was one of the victims of the Iran Revolution, and this is true that women were much freer before the fundamentalist revolution. Mm -hmm. But what I said before is true that fundamentalists always invoke the oppression of women yes. and women not getting educated. And since we are more than half the world, and we are more than half the world. I don't know if you've read Half the Sky by Nicholas Kristof mm -hmm. and Cheryl Wudun. Mm -hmm. Wherever women are educated, wherever, anywhere in the world, it could be Iran, it could be Lebanon, it could be wherever. Wherever women are educated, the whole society goes up. The society gets richer. The girls go to college and graduate school and they become leaders. And you don't have, you don't have people cutting out their clitoris. And you don't have people saying they have to stay inside the house. And you don't have people saying you can't use birth control, right? Anywhere, it doesn't matter. It could be Iran. It could be Argentina. It could be the United States. It could be Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. Fascists always oppress women because they know that when women are free, the whole society rises and becomes free. And if you haven't read Half the Sky, read it. There is not every UN report on the status of women for the last two decades has concluded, and this is transnational, this is everywhere in the world. Every UN report has shown that where women are educated and women build their own lives, they build businesses, they teach their sons and daughters the same, they are educated, the society rises. They are richer, they are building um, wonderful things, whether it's science, education, research, whether it's entrepreneurship, they are rising. So when you keep women down, you keep the whole society down. And I've been reading these UN reports on the status of women maybe for 30 years, and the conclusions are the same. So Malala Yousafzai is not the only one who knows this. I know this. She won a Nobel Prize. Yes, she was shot in the head by the Taliban. But it's a universal law that when women are kept down, the whole society goes down. And if these guys, with their Kalashnikovs and their Uzis, if they realized for five minutes that they're keeping their whole country down. But they don't. And what is the cure for it? In my opinion, it's a council of grandmothers. Now, in Native American culture, the braves fought the war, but the council of grandmothers decided when we went to war. Because only the grandmothers understood. They didn't battle the wars, they were too old. But they understood, and this is the indigenous peoples who lived on this continent before the white men came and gave everyone smallpox. They were the indigenous people of the Americas, North America, South America. And they believed that the young men go to war, but the grandmothers decide when and where to go to war. And why did the grandmothers decide? Because the grandmothers knew life and they knew how hard it was to bring forth life, and they knew that life was fragile. And if Hillary had given me the right 
to write her speeches, I would have said, what we need is a council of grandmothers like our Native American forebears. And not that Hillary's daughter had a baby, which is wonderful, of course, but it's personal. And personal is never as strong as embracing everybody and saying, this is true for all of us. If I were running for president, which God forbid I would have because um, I'm a communicator, I'm not a politician. I'm not a good politician. I get too mad. Um, but I, I would say we need the council of grandmothers that our Native American foremothers taught us, and we need to be the ones whether to go to war or make peace. And I, I believe that with all my heart. If you look at the women in the world who have made it politically, you see Angela Merkel. You see, in a country that had the most horrible fascist history, you see the countries that are governed by women. And it's different. Yes? So then. Louder, louder. Yes. So then, will we benefit as women and our daughter Can't hear you. Yeah. Do we have a microphone in the back or anything? I can speak loudly. Please! Thank you. Yeah. So then, will we as women and our daughters benefit if we have a woman in the President of the White House under the next election? I deeply believe that if Hillary is elected, because of her history, I know her history, every organization she fought for in her youth was an organization that benefited children and women. This has been obscured by the corporate press. The corporate press doesn't want anybody to know this, right? Because they want Jeb. They want Jeb because he'll cut the taxes and lead us into another depression. And if you look at American history in the 20th century, you will see that from Hoover to John F. Kennedy and Barack Obama. Every time we had a Republican administration, we lost economic clout. They spent all the money on war, and they didn't spend any money on education. And the country went down. And then a Bill Clinton would come in and change the tax structure. He did the bad thing. He raised taxes so that poor people could go to school and things. He also did some bad things. He wasn't perfect. Human beings are not perfect. We are human, we are fallible. But the economy boomed. And then when the Repub Republicans, excuse me, got back in, they we went into another depression. And that was 2008. And again, the values were all the money to bombs and wars, no money to schools, no money to women, no money to hospitals, no money to anything that benefits humanity. And, and then we had another war. And we had another war, mission accomplished! Remember that? And then we had, you know, we really had another war, and we had another deep, deep recession. And I, I would say Barack Obama could not do everything he wanted to do because he had a lot of blocks against him. But people hated him. They thought he was born in Africa. They thought he was Islamist, blah, blah, blah. It's so boring. I could go to sleep when I hear it. None of it is true. And for a long time, because he was a person of color, he was afraid to advocate for people of color. He didn't want to be identified with an angry black man of the 60s who were, at one point in our history, there were a lot of them, not anymore. But he understood that you can't be the president of a great country and not be a peacemaker. And he also understood that if you spend all the money on bombs and no money on education, you wind up in deep doo-doo, eventually. So we now have a recovery, but it's a limited recovery. It's a recovery where the people who own the huge corporations and the networks have recovered, but the people who don't have not recovered. 
And of course, Barack Obama will be will be blamed for this instead of George W. Bush, who did it. You know, people are not perfect. We're human beings, right? Why did George W. Bush want to kill Saddam Hussein? He said he wanted to kill Saddam Hussein because he tried to kill my daddy. <laughs> For somebody to make decisions in war and peace on that flimsy basis, I, I can't even comment on. But I know that if one of the Republican clown car, whether Donald Trump or Cruz or whether the George Dupree, doesn't matter, or Carly Fiorina, who I want to like because she's Italian-American, but when she was and a woman, but when she was head of that company, the company practically yeah, went yeah, down the tubes. Right so even if she's Italian-American and a woman, she's kind of mean-faced. <laughs> I agree with Trump. <laughs> but her history is not Hillary Clinton's history. Hillary Clinton's history is supporting women and children. So if you look at that, if you look at what did they do before they ran for president, that tells you everything you need to know. But as my old friend Gordy Dow used to say, we live in the United States of amnesia. <laughs> and nobody knows nothing. And nobody studies history. And so that's the problem. I believe that the Republicans cut education because they know very well that if we have an educated electorate, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. they will never elect them. That's it. Yes. One last question. Mm -hmm. Last question. You're a writer. Yes. You're a novelist. Right. I am a writer, agent, as well. What brings you to the computer, to the page now? What's the process? You talked about 10 years. The process the is, what I want to hear. What my is process, inspired? everybody wants to know about the process. Where do the books come from? My former father-in-law, Howard Fast, used to say Schenectady. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know where they come from. They come from my heart, from my kishas, my gut. I cannot tell you where they come from. I don't know where my poems come from. I don't know. I just know that I have to write. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it takes me a long time to write a book because, OK, with this book, my mother and father were dying. My daughter had three babies. My husband nearly died. My dog died, mm -hmm. Melinda Barkowitz, my standard poodle. She is the only one who's described as she really was in this book. Everybody <laughs> else is different. <laughs> um, life interrupted. Okay, but while life was interrupting, I was making notes. And I didn't find the voice for this book until quite late. Everybody wanted me to write about Isadora Wing, and I couldn't. She has too much baggage, and she's too obvious. And agents, I fired my agent, I fired my other agent, I fired my other agent, and everybody said, Erica, write about Isadora turning 60. And I seriously try, but I'm a poet and I'm a literary person. And I don't want to be obvious for the sake of commerciality. I never have done that. I'm a poet. And finally, the voice of an actor came to me, Vanessa Wonderman. And she's an actress, and she's getting to the age where she can only play the old crone. And everybody wants her to be the witch in Hansel and Gretel, <laughs> you know? And there's only one person who can do that now and still make a living, and it's Meryl Streep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my darling, darling friend, Shirley Knight, who won absolutely every award, Emmys, Tonys, whatever, she came to me one day and she said, I want to play King Lear. And that's in the book. I give that story to Vanessa Wonderman. I want to play King Lear. How can I do it? I said, you have to produce it yourself. You have to raise the money. And you know we'll all help you. And you know everybody. And 
what you can do is you can make your own production company and raise the money and then you can play King Lear. Mm -hmm. But no studio will pick it up because they're all run by guys. And they'll say, this is ridiculous. Miss Knight wants to play King Lear. She should play Queen Lear. But there is no <laughs> Queen Lear in Shakespeare. OK? Um, I give Vanessa that story because some of my best friends are actors. And I can tell you that bad as life is for writers, and it's getting worse and worse all the time. And they don't pay for this, and they don't pay for that. And they charge you for the lice, they charge you for the mice, they charge you for looking in the mirror twice. Lay <laughs> um, They've figured out a way to take your royalties, and the only person who ever protests is Taylor Swift. <laughs> she's wonderful. But she's so successful, she can protest. And the other people making music can't get arrested. So don't get me started on the corporate world and how they don't give a shit about artists. But the, the truth of the matter is, because if I get started on that, I'll never talk about anything else, and it gets very boring even to me. <laughs> um, so basically, I made Vanessa an actor. Yes, I did the vagina monologues at the West Side Arts, and I learned what, a, what an actor's life is like. And I have many friends who are actors. And I have great empathy for them because they're judged on how they look all the time. Somebody said to me this morning about my movie, about my movie of Fear of Flying, which I'm finally producing with some partners. I mentioned a certain actress, and my co-producer said, you know she's 40. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, but she can play 29 or 30 for maybe just one more year. <laughs> and um, I said, so what? She's 40. My beloved editor, who made Fear of Flying into a huge success, Elaine Coster, um, the first generation of women to be heads of publishing houses. If there had no been, if there had not been women as heads of publishing houses, this book would never, Fear of Flying would never have been published. Um, that was in 1970, at the height of the, the second wave. Before that, I couldn't have gotten this published. Let's just be real here. So. The truth of the matter is we're judged by our appearance. We're judged by our age. When I have to go to lunch with a publisher, I say to my assistant, my wonderful assistant, Jessica, I say, I have to get dressed in impersonated famous author. <laughs> <laughs> and now with high definition TV, it's the same for authors. You, you look at those people like Megyn Kelly, mm -hmm. who that asshole Trump is going to make fun of. And she's made up to a point that's yeah. absurd because yeah. of high definition TV. Yeah. Yeah. The techies are killing us. <laughs> there, there's, another, there's another thing. They're always asking, what will we do when the robots take over? Well, they have. Can I just say, people always say to me, how come you have a sense of humor? And I say, if I didn't have a sense of humor, I'd be dead. Thank you. Thank you.